Okay, yeah? go ahead. Okay. Um, the people who've organized this uh, project on the 60s asked me to ask you some questions about your experience of the 60s. Um, I guess the first question is, um, when were the 60s? When did they start and when did they end? Yes. They started in 1958 and they ended in 1975. Can you explain that? Yes. Uh, they began really in California with a, uh, with a student march. And uh, then it ended in 1975, uh, again, with uh, the end of the Vietnam War. Okay, so when people say the 60s, for you, that comprehends a much bigger... 17-year period. Time period. That's right. Okay, um, so viewing audience, Dad, um, of the Lessons from the 60s project, how you arrived at... Uh, becoming a figure in the 1960s? Well, you become a figure really by uh, not being a figure. You're, uh, two things happen. One is you, so, uh, you step up to the plate and you say, you know, I'm going to do something in this situation. So you do something in that situation, but you really don't know the... the uh, the, the end result of it, the, the, uh, where it's going to lead, but you stepped up. And that's when things really begin to change. That's when uh, the, uh, the effects are known to you personally. So, for example, uh, if you take Martin Luther King Jr., he steps up to the plate and he doesn't know what's going to happen. Uh, and he doesn't know where all this is going to lead in terms of his own life, but this is, but this is what's going to happen to him once he steps up and steps out. Well, I co-founded the Institute for Policy Studies with Dick Barnett, who died a number of years ago, uh, and the purpose of the Institute was to uh, in fact, tell truth to power. And if you look at the walls of the Institute, there's not one truth, there are many truths. You have to be in a position to be able to tell many truths. And that requires a place to be able to do that and a place to protect and aid and, uh, and to keep it going. And so that was one piece of the of this whole story. Uh, that was in 1963? Three, yeah. It depends. You can look at 62, 63, but that's 1963, exactly. And so the Institute now will celebrate its 50th anniversary and continues with many different things having happened to it, to the people. Break-ins, uh, by the government, assassinations uh, that had occurred by uh, uh, the Pinochet people. Uh, the result was deaths of, of colleagues, people very young, a 25-year-old young woman who was killed. Uh, she was your assistant, yes, Ronnie Moffat. Exactly. Uh, Ronnie Moffat, who was my assistant, and she was killed. And uh, so it caused all sorts of turmoil. And one of the questions was, how do you defend the Institute during a period of turmoil, during this period? Before the Institute, I worked uh, in the White House as a member of what was called the Special Staff of the National Security Council. And I worked for a man whose name was George Bundy, and he was the senior advisor at that time. Uh, and so I worked for him, and uh, also worked uh, as a member of the, a science group, 
which gave advice to the government and that uh, to, to the, in the White House. And there uh, I left because, in part, because of the war in Vietnam, I, the war in Vietnam, knowing that that's what was coming, that it was clear that this was a, a, a terrible, a terrible error mm -hmm. that was happening. Did you try to speak out within the White House against the yeah. developing war? Yeah, I spoke out against uh, against it. And uh, how was that received? Well, you know, I was very young, uh, relatively young. I joined the White House when I was 26, I was just 26. And uh, I was there in, the, in that place from 26 to 28, 29, something like that. And in there, I did many different things. A major thing that I did, which was, um, uh, there was a fellow whose name was Carl Kazin. And Carl was the deputy advisor to, uh, deputy national security advisor at that time. He had come from Harvard, he was very smart. And uh, he and I had a very complicated relationship. Those were very bumpy days. And uh, I had been asked to come uh, to speak uh, about those days uh, at the um, memorial in, uh, uh, in, in Boston. Uh, For Carl Kazin? Yeah. And, and it was a memorial service for Kazin, for Bundy, and so mm. forth. And uh, the memorial was predicated on the idea of how courageous they were, that they were, that they had a radical and had hired, that one they had hired a radical. And I refused and said, no, you made me a radical. <laughs> and so, therefore, There was no courage involved. It was an right. accident on there was, That's right. There was, don't look to me to come to yeah. talk. They described you as the conscience of the... National Security Council in the Kennedy White House? Yes. And you said that that was a very dangerous thing to be? Yes, to be a conscience meant that you had no power. And... Uh, that, you didn't want to be the conscience of the White House. Yeah, I had no interest in being so. You either had your own conscience and there was no at all, but I'm not going to be powerless in this situation. Yeah. You weren't going to accept all of the burden of morality for no, them so they could go off? No, everybody <laughs> has his own, his own conscience, his own being, as it were. Yeah. But to have it put into a lockbox, to use the recent term, uh, and put it someplace else, well, that was basically, to me, quite absurd. Yeah. Quite absurd indeed. So how did you end up leaving the White House then and going to create IPS? Uh, there was no future for uh, me in the White House. Uh, and uh, there's no future really for anybody, you know, in the White House. What people do once they're there is use that as a stepping stone for money or influence or power in other in other contexts later on, so that it always says in your uh, um, uh, obit that you were a member of the White House staff or that you were deputy this or whatever. And you, as you know, in an obit which everyone must read, I am a very great believer in the reading of obituaries and in preparation for what it is that your obituary is going to say. And you learn a very great deal about everybody's life and American life and world life by reading how is it that people 
spend their lives? What is it that they do in, in their lives? And so in this, uh, uh, in this case, I was concerned, would I get a Nobel Prize? Uh, would, uh, would I be known as somebody who was active with Dr. Spock in what was called the Spock trial? Where was I going to be in the list of names? Would it go Spock, <laughs> Coffin, Raskin? <laughs> you know, how are they going to present me in all of that? So I was very aware of that. And indeed, uh, commend to your attention obituaries, always. Have that <laughs> okay. in mind. But don't get overwhelmed by them. Just read, you know, read them. See the way people live and who they are. All right, so just we you go to the University of Chicago, you go to the University of Chicago Law School. Right. Um, you end up going to work in Washington for Congressman Kastemeyer and a group of liberal congressmen. Yeah, for uh, uh, first uh, uh, Leonard Wolf and Bob Kastemeyer, right. And then that was when you went to the White House. Yeah. Then you left the White House and with Richard Barnett, you founded the Institute for Policy right. Studies. All right, so th that sets the table then for what these guys want to hear about, which is... <laughs> um, what do you think we've been talking about? <laughs> um, well, the, the, we've set the table. So now do you think you, this is all the youth wants to know? Is that... <laughs> well, so one question is, um, you, um, you first became a leader in the anti-Vietnam War movement when you wrote the statement called A Call to Resist Illegitimate Authority yes. that was published in a number of newspapers across the yes. country. Um, that became the basis for your indictment along with Dr. Spock, William Sloan Coffin, Michael Ferber, and Mitchell Goodman in the so-called Boston Five case. Right. You know, the interesting thing about that, Jamie, was it was called, it was not called an indictment. It was an information. An information. Yeah, yeah. Um, so okay, so there was an information filed against you guys. You were not. You were not arrested. You were never arrested, but the information was filed against you. How did you learn that you had been brought up on these charges? How did you first learn of the indictment? Uh, on the radio, it, it came across. On the, on the radio, or at that time, it's television as, as well. That, that I had been. Uh, that the information was presented, that Dr. Spock had been indicted, as they put it, mm -hmm. uh, with four others. Mm -hmm. And there were pictures then in the New York Times and uh, in the Post, you know, across the country. So you guys were charged with conspiracy to aid and abet draft evasion. Um, right. Did the five defendants know each other? No, not not really. Uh, the lawyers kind of, one or two of the lawyers knew each other. The ACLU lawyers knew each other in the case. But the people you were accused of engaging conspiracy with, really, you didn't know? No, not really. Describe what this call to resist illegitimate authority was about, what you had in mind the in writing it. The call to resist was a statement of saying there is such a thing as legitimate authority. And legitimate, legitimate authority meant that it, in, by, uh, it included justice and law together. And where those elements were not present, then it was behooved you to resist as a citizen, as a person. Either way, as a citizen or a person, you had to say no. You, you're not part of that. And you're prepared to uh, support those who do that as well. <clears throat> and that meant that uh, there were certain things, certain elements, uh, that you had to, that a person had to uh, 
uh, live up to. One was that uh, if you uh, saw a person who um, was in need and you didn't resist, there was something wrong with you. So you had to be prepared to do that. The person, uh, you had to make the judgment that the person who was resisting was doing so in good conscience. So again, the conscience is not set aside, the conscience is part of the day-to-day -day life of people. And so those elements were present at that time. Because there were lots of young people who were burning their draft because cards or turning them in or refusing to participate. who were burning their draft cards or, or turning them in. Some were burning them. Uh, and that was a statement uh, that, that turned out to be a very, a very interesting statement because it meant that they were, that, uh, and, and here, uh, Coffin would invite people up to burn their draft cards. Well, he was the uh, chaplain at Yale University. And as the chaplain at Yale, this was a very big deal because everybody went to chapel in those days uh, and it was against the state, so the, the state was being burned symbolically by the church. Uh, and then there was another position, the position again remained underneath it all, the in good conscience thing. Uh, and as you know, when you uh, you can either uh, affirm uh, or swear, and so you know people affirm they swore whatever, but that was a very a very big moment in American history. Mm -hmm. um, what was your experience of the trial itself in Boston? Uh, the trial, um, the trial had had many elements to it. Uh, one was uh, a, a sense of boredom. The, you know, there's a very great deal that goes on in a trial. It's, it's just boring, uh, and. Uh, one of the people, Ferber, uh, spent the time reading in Greek <laughs> at the trial. And uh, Coffin was burning the, uh, uh, burning the, uh, uh, the for the churches. He the was draft cards. The, the draft cards, right. So we were seeing that. And people were trying to get next to Spock, who was everybody's baby doctor at the time. Yeah. So that was the major <laughs> thing that went on there. The other thing, of course, that happened, which was very important, is that everybody who was in that trial, knowing, and, and, and this will give you a sense of the difficulty of, of trials, whether you're innocent or guilty or whatever, no one's relationship stayed, personal relationship stayed. Everyone either got divorced or separated or whatever, and the relationship ended. Mm -hmm. And so now know what it's like where people who are, in a sense, at the top rung of a society that this happens to. But imagine what this happens to people who have nothing and who lose everything at, at the same time. Mm -hmm. The um, defendants and acquitted you. Yes. And I, I looked in anticipation of this interview, I looked at a couple of the old books about this and one of them said that, um, one said you joked about it and said you could demand a retrial in your case, but another said that you actually were devastated that I they say you were acquitted and the others were found guilty. Yeah, no, I was, I was devastated 
And I cried, actually, because, and then I was asked about it. I said, and I was asked by the various reporters, and I said that I felt very good for myself and terrible for the others. And my <coughs> lawyers uh, were very important in this, in this case. I had the presence of mind to ask uh, a lawyer whose name was Taylor to be my lawyer. Wait, not Telford Taylor. Telford Taylor. Oh, Telford Taylor, okay, yeah. To be my lawyer. For war and crimes process. Exactly. And I knew that if he was the lawyer, every time the case would be mentioned in the press, it would say the war crimes. The Nuremberg prosecutor. Prosecutor. Hmm. And that was a very important way to get the war crimes issue going. Here is this case, you know, this kind of huge mess of material, mess of feelings, uh, just a mess of, of, of the time. And uh, during that period as well, uh, the question was, if they are guilty, I am guilty. That was a big a big deal. Do you consider the 60s, writ large as people talk about them, a positive moment for American democracy or a negative moment? I, I view it as a positive moment, <clears throat> very much so. Why? Uh, because it was, again, it was a statement of saying that as individuals and as citizens, uh, you could resist. And there would be others there who would resist as well. And indeed, at that time, there were other movements. There was, uh, there was a, uh, a document called Resistance. That was another group that had put together a document called Resistance mm -hmm. as well. And then, but the call to resist turned out to be, I think, the, I say that uh, uh, with great ego, the most important. Mm -hmm. With great modesty and ego, mm -hmm. that was the most important. Why do you, well, what do you think were the major successes of that period? And what were the failures and what, what could have been done differently or ought to be done differently to, to uh, ensure a more progressive future for people? Each, uh, each area, yeah, each time, uh, does not reflect on its own time. It reflects on the past. And one of the important things to do is to find a way of being self-reflexive about the moment that you're living through, which then becomes the basis upon which the next generation can build as well. And I would see that as a very important lesson uh, to be learned, which was only learned in part. Mm -hmm. Secondly, it would have allowed for coming to grips and, and with the question of how to confront, confront and protect certain people, how to take into account who was to be protected, and not an easy, not an easy thing to do.